through this Equip to Serve um, book or lessons on spiritual gifts this past few months and studying the spiritual gifts. And I really have been so encouraged by conversations with several of you about this outside of our study time. So many of you are excited to see the ways that God might use you and the giftings that he's given you. And you're asking questions about different things. And I just think it's really exciting and beautiful. I just, my goal is for this study to just kind of revolutionize the way that we think about spiritual gifts. Just to be really excited about the fact that the great God of the universe sees you. He knows you, he loves you, and he has specifically given you a gifting set for you to use for the betterment of your church family. And we don't just care about what he's given us, but we care about our sisters in Christ in different ways that they minister to us through the gifts of the Spirit. It's just a beautiful thing. Spiritual gifts is not a staunch or cold or legalistic or burdensome doctrine we should not feel a burden when it comes to spiritual gifts because it, it's beautiful it's beautiful i don't think it's an overstatement to say that the doctrine of spiritual gifts is really a glorious doctrine because spiritual gifts are an expression of two really beautiful and glorious things. And the first is that spiritual gifts are an expression of God's love to his children, to his child, to us, so that his children can in return, after they've been given gifts um, from the Holy Spirit, they can turn and pivot and pour out the gifts that God has given them and in love on their brothers and sisters in Christ. Our spiritual gifts and serving and ministering to one another is an expression of God's love to us and then our love to the church. This is how we take care of each other, is by using our spiritual gifts. This is how we minister to each other. This is how God draws us together. We are not spectators in our Christian life. We don't come in and go out on Sunday morning for an hour and think, okay, I can mark the box of Christianity in my life. No, we are called to be partakers in the ministry. We're called to be worshipers of our God. We're called to be um, people that are reflecting the glory of Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is through our spiritual gifts. And this is why we're studying this topic. The building up of our bodies of Christ, the church that God has put us in, Anchor Bible Church, Heritage Bible Church. If you go to a different church in town, that church to honor and serve your Lord and your brothers and sisters. So secondly, scripture is very clear about several things regarding spiritual gifts, several things. And before we talk about exhortation and faith, for tonight, our two topics tonight, I just want to quickly review three points from our past couple of lessons regarding spiritual gifts. I just don't ever want us to forget these three things. The first thing is that, as we talked about, on, upon salvation, you're given a spiritual gift, right? God gifts us with a specific spiritual gift. He intends us to use this gift for our local church for his glory and for the edification and growth of our church family. That's the intention. It's not for personal use. It's not for use outside the walls of the church, although we, we do that. But the intended purpose, the primary purpose of our spiritual gift is for our local body of believers. Um, this is key. It's an important way for us to show the love of God, you know, in our church family. Romans 12, 6 talks about this. In Romans 12, 6, he says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And in 1 Peter 4, 10, he says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So we've been given a gift, and we're to employ that gift. The second thing we've talked about is, is that our spiritual gifts are not the same. They don't look the same. They don't have the same results. They're not used in the same ministries. Um, we looked several times at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 7. I think if we don't come away with anything else, I just really think that this passage really will ground us and be kind of our foundation for understanding spiritual gifts. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 
four to seven. You can turn there if you want, because we're gonna, I just kind of want to dig in a tiny bit, not as much as we have already. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse four to seven, he says, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So I just want to keep before us the fact that the gifts are varied, varieties of gifts. The ministries for those gifts are varied, a variety of ministries. The effects of those gifts are varied, a variety of effects. Varied, varied, varied. It's different, it's different, it's different. It should do away with comparing each other with each other. It should do away with discontentment with each other. It should do away with all of the things that make serving hard because it's varied, it's different. But also, I want to draw attention to another word repeated three times in this passage. An amazing word. Same, same, same. Three times. Yes, the gifts are different. Yes, the ministries are different. Yes, the effects are different. But they're from the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. The source of our spiritual gifts is from the same place. And yet, He has chosen to make it look different in each of our lives in a beautiful way. We did a little project with painting, you know, last time and just how the spiritual gifts can be seen as paint on a canvas and the Lord uses that paint within our church and it just creates this beautiful portrait of unity and family and church. So thirdly, the characteristics of our gift is that it is a gift. And that's the third point I want to want to review before we keep going. Our spiritual gifts are a gift. It's not a burden. It's not a drudgery. It's not a to-do list. It shouldn't be exhausting. It's not a task. It's not a little checked box. It is a gift from God. An incredible, supernatural, thoughtful, useful joy producing fruit bearing gift from God in your life and to look at it that way this is God's gift to us a specific gift when our spiritual gift is not used for selfish purposes or with motives that promote self but in his strength and his purpose then they will bring the joy and the purpose that God intends and then they will be used to equip and build up and edify our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we recognize this is something God has given us to turn and pour out on our brothers and sisters in Christ. I should probably tell you that Matt and I were having a discussion as we often do, you know, as we're studying for the various things and we were talking about spiritual gifts. And to be honest with you, I was pressing him trying to get like specifics about some things with spiritual gifts. And I was just kind of like, you know, pressing him for some concrete answers, clarity, you know, that we all want. Like, do we have more than one spiritual gift? Is it a combination of spiritual gifts? Is it one spiritual gift? Are there more spiritual gifts than what's put in scripture? You know, blah, 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 blah. And the second thing, how do we know for certain which gift we have? Like, what are we supposed to do? You know, the typical spiritual gift questions that we all have, right? But finally, when I took a breath and paused, he looked at me. <laughs> and he said, Corey, we cannot look for concrete biblical answers where there's not a concrete biblical answer. God's word does not say, go figure out your spiritual gift. God's word does not say, whether there's a combination in people's lives or whether there's just one particular one and we manifest the other ones in smaller ways, it just doesn't say it. But what we are to do is focus on what is clear in Scripture. And what is clear is the fact that we are to use our gifts to serve, right? And I want to be clear then as we're studying through the spiritual gifts that I don't come across as drawing hard lines where there just isn't any where there isn't any hard lines. The only person that we know for certain had all of the spiritual gifts and practiced them all perfectly is Jesus. 
right? Because Jesus is God. There was nothing lacking in his personhood or in his expression of spiritual gifts. He did it perfectly. He's perfect and he is our example of how to live and use our spiritual gifts in a perfect way. So that's why we study him and that's why in your books there's a section on Jesus and maybe different ways that he had shown different spiritual gifts. That's why there's a section in there on word studies of the various spiritual gifts so you can read through and see um, where the gift was shown in the word of God. So we serve, we, Ephesians 2.10, do the good works that God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And when we do that, when we're serving, when we're busy about the work of God, then the spirit brings forth fruit. And this fruit will flourish, particularly in different areas of our giftedness, right? The work that we do will have an effect on our churches, period. But when we have a spiritual gift, it will flourish. And that work that we do within our church will bring extra joy, will bring extra result, will bring extra encouragement to our sisters in Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says, the reason God gave the various gifts is Ephesians 4 verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ. And then in verse 13, he says the reason it's to attain unity in the faith. And to have knowledge of the Son of God. Have you ever been on a missions trip? Or have you ever been involved in a church project? Where everybody is just serving. And it's hard work. It's not easy. But as you're serving together, you're drawn together. Because you're working towards the same purpose. And different people's strengths come up. Somebody might be over there evangelizing. Somebody might be over there telling people what to do. Somebody might be over there, the gopher and the go-to, getting things done. Somebody might be over there teaching, you know. Right, And it is a beautiful thing, and it creates unity when we use our spiritual gifts. And obviously, in the church, it's the same way. When we are utilizing our spiritual gifts, and we're, we are of one mind, and we are unified in the Spirit of God. This takes all of us, right? Verse 14, Ephesians chapter 4 says, The result, or the reason, so that we're not tossed here and there by trickery and deceitfulness. When we're using our spiritual gifts, as it says in verse 13, to attain unity in faith, to have knowledge of the Son of God, the result is we're not tossed here and there by trickery and deceitfulness. And in verse 15, so we will grow up into all aspects of him, of Christ. I just think sometimes we can get so distracted from what God has given us to do. Right? And our distractions pull us away from truth, pull us away from our purpose, pull us away from our family, from our church family. And those things can cause trouble in our life. But if we can be focused on the one thing, let's glorify God, let's roll up our sleeves, let's serve one another together, let's love one another well, then that is what brings unity in the body of Christ. Verse 16 it says, for him, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So we see here that the whole body is held together if each of us are properly working, right? We've talked about this before. And I, I just, have, as I've been studying, I'm just so excited about this product, about this topic in general. And I just, my goal, I guess, is to get you excited about it too, because it's just beautiful. You know, that God gives us purpose and direction and he gives us what we need to fulfill those things. And we are here to reflect Christ, right? What better way to do it than working together? At salvation, an amazing thing happened. God gave us everything that we needed to reorient our life. Before salvation, who do we live for? Me. Before salvation, what am I pursuing? Me. Right? All of those things. But after I have been saved, he gives me everything I need to reorient my life, to live for him. No longer do I live for me, but I live for him. 
No longer am I jealous of my own time of using my treasures the way that I want to, but I use it for him. And he enables us to do that. And we offer it up gladly to him because as we continue to say, he purchased every second of our life as salvation. Every second of our life has been bought with the precious blood of Christ. And now we get to turn and just pour out our life for our brothers and sisters for the sake of Christ to show him, to make his name known. 2 Corinthians 5.15, I'm just going to rattle off several verses. 2 Corinthians 5.15, he died for all so that they who live will no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I live now, I live, in the, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself up for me. And 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, speaking of Christ, he says, arm yourself with the same purpose so as to live the rest of your time in the flesh no longer for the less of men, but for the will of God. I mean, does that make you excited? It should make you so excited. He bought us for a reason. He purchased us for a reason. And so we study the spiritual gifts. So let's get to it. Enough introduction. Okay, this week we're talking about the gifts of exhortation and of faith. We'll spend more time on exhortation than we will faith. So don't get nervous. Romans chapter 12, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, we see this word exhortation used in the list of spiritual gifts. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation. He says, exercise the gift of exhortation according to the grace that you have been given. Like, that's your job. If you're an exhorter, then he says exhort. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> Paul says, since you have it, this is a matter of fact statement. You do have a gift. Since you have it, use it. That's basically what this passage is saying. And so if you have in your possession from the Spirit of God the gift of exhortation, exhort. So what does this word exhort mean? Okay, the word exhortation encompasses more than just an admonishment. I think sometimes we think exhortation is the all up in your face, straighten up right now type of a thing, but it's not always used that way. That's one, that's one facet, right? Admonishment. But also, exhortation can be entreating. It can be comforting. It can be instructing. It's more than just exhortation. But it's also this encouragement, this comfort, this begging sometimes. Matt referenced a couple weeks ago um, in a sermon, a well-known quote that says, the job of a pastor is to comfort people in their affliction and afflict people in their comfort right that's also i think a good description of an ex of an exhorter somebody is afflicted you comfort them right you encourage them somebody is not afflicted maybe they are um may or i mean if somebody is afflicted yeah oh gosh i just lost my train of thought right if they're too comfortable what do you do you exhort them what are you doing snap out of it let's get busy right you know feet on the feet on the coffee table leaning back on the couch teenage son that has a list of things he should be doing right that's going to be an exhortation moment in my house right and this is the job of the of the exhorter afflict people in their comfort comfort people in their affliction look at first thessalonians 5 11 first thessalonians 5 11 He says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as you also are doing. And in verse 14 and 15, he says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, 
but always after that which is good for one another and for all people. We're always seeking the good of one another. These are exhorting verses. These are exhorting words. And I, I love these verses because to me they imply caretaking of one another, right? They're taking care of one another. Admonish, encourage, help, and look at how it's to be done. In patience, seeking the good for one another and for all. So I'd like for us to consider the fact that if exhortation is not present, if it's not being done in a biblical way, then it becomes a breeding ground for gossip, for dangerous unity messing with <laughs> gossip, right? Because what would be the opposite of helping and encouraging, of correcting, of building up the body of believers? So track with me. Maybe I see something that's off in my brother or sister's life, right? I see something off, or maybe I hear about a sin in the life of my sister or brother. So what's the biblical response to that, to sin being found out in their life? We turn to Matthew 18, don't we? Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins, go show him his fault in private, in private. <laughs> if he listens to you, you have won your brother. So there's no opportunity for seeds of gossip to sprout. There's no opportunity for bitterness to grow up. There's no opportunity for misunderstandings because, oh, I see something that's not quite right. I'm going to go and, and ask them about that. I'm going to go and encourage them about that, right? Exhorting is so important in our, in our Christian life. If there's no exhortation, then we're tempted to go somewhere else. Oh, I saw this. I don't know what to do about it. Do you know about this? Right? It can just cause trouble. And maybe that person that I went to might, you know, share it or confide in somebody that they know. Because exhortation didn't happen in a biblical way. And pretty soon, gossip is rampant. Right? There's unity. There's no unity. There's division. There's trouble. But also, exhortation carries the weight of being absolute without exception okay so not only is it correcting admonishing encouraging helping but it's absolute and it's without exception and this is sometimes where exhorters can you know get in trouble or come across a little harsh right um exhortation carries with it um the weight of not having a doubt not having any reservations there's a certainty implied in exhortation and so what is the only certain, absolute, true measure that we have that we can hold up to a life that we think might need encouragement or correction? It's the word of God. And so this is key in the gifting set of an exhorter. The word of God contains everything that we need for life and godliness. The word of God has all the right words to say in this situation. The word of God is the thing that corrects. The word of God is the thing that encourages. The word is, of God is the thing that sheds light on sin in our life. God's word speaks to our affliction. God's word speaks to our comfort. God's word speaks to our sin in our life. And so God's word is paramount for the exhorter. Scripture is chief when we are an exhorter. It is the word of God spoken in a kind way with seasoning like salt, right? That does its work, that brings out truth. Our personal preferences or opinions have no place in an exhortation moment, right? Whether we're admonishing, correcting, or encouraging, personal preference doesn't belong there. Human judgment doesn't belong there. Fleshly skepticism does not belong there. A hypercritical spirit does not belong in an exhortation moment. Our flawed interpretation maybe of somebody else's life does not belong in the words of a godly exhorter. Questions, they, they belong. Allow questions and answers, they belong. Gentle reminders of the word of God, they belong. Clear, bold truth of God's word, it belongs. And listen, if we have a strength in our character, like a boldness in our speech, some of you are so bold and so strong and so good at just communicating truth in the right moment, right? If you have a fearlessness in speaking truth in hard moments, then you might have the gift of exhortation. It's very possible. 
But also, some of us maybe are bold to speak, right? Quick to say something, and it might just be a sin issue. So we need to be discerners with exhortation as well, and that's why the Word of God has to come in. That's what sifts through my opinion, my hypercriticalness versus what is true and what is right. Truth and motive is the difference in exhortation versus a sinful, judgmental spirit. Exhortation has to be rooted in truth. It has to have godly motives. It has to have the goal of restoring brothers and sisters to right relationship with Christ or right relationship with other people, right? And it must be rooted in the word of God. In our Equipped to Serve book, Chris draws our attention to other things that exhorters need to guard against. Um, a couple of things was um, being a know-it-all or being pious, right? We need to guard against that if we're an exhorter. Being demanding, right? Um, like demanding immediate results um, can be a, a trouble spot for an exhorter. Also, when we were doing the She Calls Him Lord series, we did a session on our mouth and on our words right it might be a good lesson for us to review if we feel like we have this gift and we talked in that lesson about the fact that nothing needs to be said right now right unless it's a life-saving thing like stop or look out or run right if i need to run please tell me to run <laughs> but instead we need to be patient with our words we need to be women that have self-control if we're an exhorter we need to be women that before we speak we pray before we speak, we search scripture, right? Before we speak, we pause. We just need to give the Holy Spirit a minute to work, to remind us of truth, to check our motives, to give our words grace and kindness before we speak them. And this is important. Pause, pray, then proceed if we're an exhorter. And sometimes proceeding means keep praying. <laughs> Right? Sometimes proceeding means proclaim the truth. Just say it. You know, be strong, be bold. So I want to talk quickly before we go on to faith. I want to talk quickly about the other side of exhortation. Because if exhortation is happening right in our friendships, in our churches, then that means that we are exhorted sometimes because we're not perfect. And we need our sisters to come alongside and say, hey, so I just wanted to ask you about something really quick. Or I just wanted to talk to you. And the, the other side is what is our response to that when I'm the one that's being exhorted? Because remember, this gift is present for our benefit. It's a loving thing from God that he would put this in our life, in our churches to correct us and keep us on a path. Exhortation is a form of correction and it's often the first step of discipline as we saw in Matthew 18 to exhort, to go to our brother or sister. But something that I would talk with my kids about is that my love for them is shown in my parenting of them, right? And this is where the exhortation part comes in. Correction is a display of our love. It's a protection. Proverbs 13, 24 tells us that the one who withholds his rod of discipline hates his son. But he who loves his son disciplines him diligently. And exhortation is a corrective measure because we're sinners. We want to go the way of our sin, just like our three-year-old wants to do what they're not supposed to right? We want that. And if our sinful way is not corrected, we end up turning aside and ending up quickly in a destructive lifestyle or in misery. That's just what happens because sin is icky and it's no fun, right? I say this often to my little one. It's no fun to be sad. Why are you sad? <laughs> Happy is way more fun, right? And sin is powerful and Satan is prowling and he's looking for our weaknesses. He can find them. He is deceitful and masterful he's been studying humankind since the day adam and eve hit the earth right he knows how to find our weaknesses so we need to be ready and when we don't see something in our life then our sister coming alongside and saying hey you know let me talk to you about something is a loving thing hebrews 12 11 says all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful right but to those who have been trained by it, what does it yield? It, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, 
right? Being disciplined, being corrected, being put back on the right path yields peace and a life of righteousness. We need our loving and wise exhorters to help us stay on the right path. But sadly, instead, our response when we're corrected or exhorted might be dismissiveness. We dismiss it. Oh, I'm not going to let her negativity, you know, bother me. I'm not going to let it damper my day, right? Oh, that's just their opinion. Maybe we rebel against correction in our life. We grow defensive. I get defensive, right? Well, that's because, or I justify. Um, we deflect, right? We change the subject. We ignore it, push it away. We have pity parties. We sulk. We mope. We stew. We grow bitter. Sometimes we lash back, right? All the wrong responses to exhortation in our life, to loving correction in our life. Sometimes the correction in our life is not loving. <laughs> Sometimes it hurts and it's harsh. But there's truth there for us. Sometimes we have to weed through the way that somebody told us something and look for the truth that might have been there, right? When we respond in those ways, I really believe that we not only squander a precious gift of the Spirit in somebody else's life, but I, I fortify myself against God's work in my life. And I make a harder exterior for him to be able to mold me and shape me and help me be more like Christ. Those are responses of my sin nature. Those are responses of my rebelliousness or immaturity even. And it will create my growth in Christ. It will make it slow instead of the pace at which God would rather it be, right? It's a process, we know that, but I want to get there as fast as possible, right? Because it's no fun <laughs> to be sad. It's no fun not to be changed. So how should we respond? Um, number one, four ways we should respond to uh, exhortation in our life. First reflection, is what they're saying true? If someone else had done what I, or said what I, what I did or said, would I consider that a good reflection of the character of Christ? We need to reflect upon what they're saying and look at it in perspective. Secondly, prayerful consideration when we're exhorted. We go to the Lord in prayer. Sometimes we might not even respond to them. Our response can just simply be, you know what, I really need to pray about this. We don't need to have an answer. We don't need to come back with a, a quick comeback. We don't need to engage if we're wounded. I need to pray about this. And we go straight to our Father and we say, Lord, is there truth in this? Is what she's saying true? Help me to see how I can honor you this, Lord, in this. What do you have for me to learn from this? How can I make this right in my life, Lord? What things should I be studying? What things should I be praying about? What guards should I put up in my life? What boundaries do I need to do? Lord, just give me wisdom. That's the second step, prayerful consideration. Thirdly, gratitude. If somebody is bold enough to come to you with hard truth, I mean, have you ever exhorted and you're just stirred up? It's hard. You're worried how they're going to take it. You don't want to say it. You're, you know, in twists and knots. And yet this person came to you, even though they likely were up at night worried about how the conversation was going to go. So then when they do, we need to have gratitude towards them for being bold and coming to us. Thank you. Thank you for caring for me enough to have this hard conversation. Thank you for helping me to grow to be more like Christ. Thank you. Maybe they're wrong. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clear this up. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for protecting me from dishonoring my God. Thank you. Gratitude. And fourthly, humility. Humility. So important. You're right. This is an area of struggle in my life. I appreciate you coming to me with this. This is an area of weakness and sin in my heart. Can you pray with me? Can you walk alongside me? Can you help me? Because none of us have it together. We are doing this together, right? And we need exhorters. We need to have hearts that are ready to accept exhortation in our life. Okay, faith. The gift of faith. The gift of faith is different 
than saving faith. So if you did your little, you know, quiz or whatever, your little evaluation of spiritual gifts, which I've said before, it's not inspired. So don't stress about it, right? It's just something fun to do. And get and the gift of faith is at the bottom of your list. You don't need to question your salvation, right? That's not what this is. Saving faith, different than the spiritual gift of faith, saving faith is the recognition, right, that we're sinners. Saving faith is recognizing that we cannot please God. We cannot have a relationship with God because he's holy and righteous and our sins separate us from God. Saving faith believes that God, because of his great love, became a man so that he could grow up, die on the cross, take the wrath of God against my sin. A lot of people call it the great exchange, right? Christ, the perfect unblemished lamb of God took my sin and in return has given me righteousness because he bore the wrath that God had for me and when he did that he removed my sin for as the barrier between me and a God who wants relationship with me I love Psalm 103 verse 12 as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgression from us <laughs> Saving faith believes that. It believes the gospel. Good news. The spiritual gift of faith is different. It's different. Ryrie, in his book, in his basic theology book, boils it down. He says the gift of faith is the ability to believe God for the supply of specific needs. Every believer should walk by faith, and each has a measure of faith, but not all have the gift of faith. So we all have a measure of faith. We're all called to walk by faith. But the gift of faith is a supernatural gift. A strong conviction, ladies, in God's ability to supply what we need. A strong conviction in God's power and his control over seemingly impossible circumstances. That's the gift of faith. We all should have faith. We all should have confidence and, and assurance in the person and the work and the character and the ability of God. That's unquestionable. We all should have that. There's no reason not to have that. God doesn't fail. He's perfect. He's mighty. There's nothing he cannot do. But the gift of faith is extra in this sense. So if you have your book, look at page 48 with me. If you don't have it, that's okay because I'll read it. But in the book on page 48, talking about the gift of faith, let me find it. Chris says, this faith believes anything God has done, he can do. This faith does not rely on money, people, or themselves. It relies on the source of all things through a powerful prayer life. If you have the gift of faith, you often have an unruffled exterior. You know, when the sky is falling, you're whistling a happy tune and going about your business, right? If you have the gift of faith. You're not the worst case scenario thinker. That's not your go-to. You know how many of us can relate? A little one in our sphere of influence is coughing and all of a sudden in our mind, they're in the hospital on a breathing machine, right? It's a cough. Okay, that's not a gift of faith. This is not... Um, this is not the gift of faith. Those with the gift of faith are not at the graveside of their teenager when they pull out of the driveway the first time. That's not the gift of faith. It's like, bye, honey, see you later. Pick up a Coke on your way home, please. You know, gift of faith. Just because our phone rings at 9.40 p.m., the gift of faith doesn't panic, right? They're not known for doomsday. The gift of faith people don't have an Eeyore perspective on life, right? But instead, they're optimists. The gift of faith is optimistic. They might not be exuberant in their personality. That's okay. Some people, the gift of faith are, but some are just the even keel, steady eddies in our life. They're steady. They don't overreact. Their first response is to believe the best. A lot of us take a while to get there, right? And as we mature in our Christian faith, that period of time to get there should be getting lower or slower or closer together between panic and rest. But with the gift of faith, it's just like something terrible happened. You know what? God's got this. He's going to work this out. That's the gift of faith. We need people like that in our life to kind of give us a bedrock. Chris points out that if you have the gift of faith, then you have a powerful prayer life. 
People with the gift of faith pray these huge prayers and other people are like, what? I don't think you can ask for that. You know, <laughs> the gift of faith, huge prayers, huge requests that we seem are ridiculous or impossible and really requests that might not even be on our radar. We were praying with some friends uh, not long ago and afterwards my husband and I were talking and he said something to the effect of, I just didn't even think to pray that. That was so beautiful. You know, the gift of faith, they think outside the box in their prayers. They know what God can do. The one with the spiritual gift of faith, nothing is too difficult for thee. Some of you know that song, right? God's word says it. They believe it. Jeremiah 32, 17, a verse for the person that lives with the gift of faith. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your outstretched arm. and Nothing is too difficult for thee. God breathed in the world. The gift of faith, that's their go-to. Why are we worried? God breathed in the world. <laughs> Nothing is too difficult for thee. He made the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah 32, 27. He says himself, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? I mean, come on. Right? Really? The person with the gift of faith is not one to be easily discouraged. She's not one that's often depressed or anxious. She's not one that generally worries or frets. She has trust. She has belief. She has confidence in God. Not to say that she never worries. She never frets, right? But the go-to is trust. So as a result, those with the gift of faith should guard themselves against maybe a lack of compassion towards those that aren't quite there yet, towards those that are struggling with worry, with sadness, with sorrow, with anxiety. Those with the gift of faith don't just bounce into the hospital room and say, oh, everything's gonna be fine and leave. They need to think through the eyes of their savior who had compassion on the weak, who had compassion on us, whose followers said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The gift of faith should recognize that, should guard against that. And this is why faith needs to be cloaked in love. We're going to look at one more passage tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Sometimes we miss a part of this famous chapter. I want us to look at the end of verse 2 in 1 Corinthians. Speaking of the various gifts here, Paul says in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13, If I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, so this is a huge faith, a faith that believes in overcoming insurmountable obstacles, a mountain. I have faith so big it can remove the mountains if I have that, but I do not have love. I'm nothing. And here it is, the important Achilles heel of somebody with great faith forgetting about the love part, right? Forgetting about the compassion, the mercy, the gentleness. Faith must be exercised in love because remember, it is a gift from the Holy Spirit for the building up of the body of Christ. This is not just for my own benefit if we've got the gift of faith so that I can go through life, to, you know, skipping through my troubles. It is to encourage and build up the body of Christ. So what does it mean that it's wrapped in love? Because among many other things, the famous love chapter in 1 Corinthians is on the heels of how we should partner up with the various gifts, right? The gift of faith. And so we read through all the things that we know. He says, if I have faith but don't have love, I'm nothing. And then in verse 4, what is love? Okay, we've got the definition now. So to expand the teaching that love and faith have to go together based on this passage this is what we see love is patient so faith must be accompanied with patience for our brothers and sisters in Christ be patient with the one who is lagging behind in their faith in their own trust in God's plan kindness must accompany the gift of faith let the confidence that you have about the power of God, let that be cloaked in gentleness. Let it be cloaked in care for your sister who might not share that confidence. 
That's important in the gift of faith. There should be no jealousy, no boasting, no arrogance, no unbecoming qualities, no self-seeking, no provocation in the gift of faith. For example, you know, you pray a big prayer when you've got the gift of faith and God does big things and he answers your big prayer, but it has nothing to do with you. So there should be no arrogance in the gift of faith, right? It is all a work of God. Or on the flip side, maybe you're praying this big prayer. God answers it in a big way, but not the way you expected, right? And that's where self-seeking, unbecoming, jealousy can creep into the gift of faith. I prayed this big prayer. He answered it, but that wasn't really what I wanted, right? That's an Achilles heel in the gift of faith. That's not cloaking our faith in love. Because love partnered with faith knows that the answer that we got was God's best, right? It's the working of the Lord. It should cause praise and honor in Christ. There should be never be retaliation in our gift of faith. There should never be a spirit of anything um, that we hope for in our, in our prayers in the gift of faith, right? No spirit of retaliation present or hoped for in the gift of prayers of those that are strong in their faith. Instead, truth and burden bearing and belief and hope and endurance accompany the gift of faith. We come alongside, we endure with our brothers and sisters, we get under the load, we bear the burden with them in the gift of faith. We offer them hope, we remind them of what they believe, of what we believe. Because with the gift of faith comes clarity in chaos. So if you have the gift of faith and it's cloaked in love and you step into a hard thing with your sister in Christ, you have clarity that she might not have. Her world is in chaos. And so then you can speak truth cloaked in love in that situation. Those with the gift of faith have an incredible opportunity because we all benefit from those with the gift of faith. They help us tremendously in our attitudes in our focus, in our outlook on life. They can be used by God to help us trust in God's provision in our church, whether it's an intangible need or a, a spiritual need or a tangible need. Uh, Chris also had mentioned in her lesson that those with the gift of faith encourage us to step out of our comfort zone, right? To stretch our faith, to watch God work. We need to do that, whether we have the gift of faith or not. You know, okay, I'm gonna step outside my comfort zone a little bit, see what God does. He might do amazing things, right? Make you take a bigger step next time. Those with the gift of faith are cheerleaders for us sometimes when we're behind, we're beat down, we can't get any ground. They see the way through and they'll drag us along with them. You know, just hold on. If you have somebody with the gift of faith in your life, hold on to that girl. See what God does, right? The gift of faith injects energy into our body of believers. The people with the gift of faith are the George Mueller type people. And that's what we need in our, in our circles. And so I would just wanna close with this quick thing on George Mueller. For those of you that don't know him, most of you I'm sure do, but this might be a good reminder to us about a, the gift of faith in this man's life. So George Mueller, as many of you know, was a British missionary in the 1800s. He was a man with the gift of faith. He built five orphan houses Records show that he cared for 10,024 orphans in his lifetime. That's what this man did. And every child graduated from his orphanages, it said, with a job lined up. In fact, some outsiders accused Mueller of rising people above their stations, rising the poor above their natural station by preparing them in this way. After he died, his orphanages continued and supported over 100,000 more orphans, supported them with food, with shelter, with a home. My husband, Matt, actually has the heart of George Mueller. Shocking, I know. <laughs> when we lived in Iowa and started our foster care journey, an old Walmart building was for sale down the road. And he said, hey, we need to buy this and fill it up with you know, children from the foster care but he didn't marry a woman with the gift of faith. So that quickly, that conversation quickly ended. I was just tired, that's all, right? But when George Mueller told his father 
that he wanted to become a missionary, his father's response was to cut off funding for his college tuition. He was not impressed that he wanted to be a missionary. So instead of considering this as, well, I guess the Lord is closing the door on my missions plan, Mueller went to his knees in prayer and he asked the Lord to be his provider because his father was his provider. And it says within an hour, Mueller got a knock on his door and it was a professor who paid him for a tutoring job. So the Lord provided almost instantly. After Mueller graduated from missionary school, it's told that he was devastated by the orphans that lined the streets of England. And at the time, there were thousands of homeless children that were freezing to death, that were starving to death, or who were forced into abusive labor in workhouses. So Mueller felt the calling of God to open an orphanage, even though he only had two shillings in his pocket, which is basically 50 cents. He was sure that God would provide for every specific need. And over the years, England witnessed the work of God through George Mueller as buildings went up, as people came in to oversee the orphans, as furniture, food, clothing, and money for these children through George Mueller's faith came in. What a statement of the faithfulness of God. And one of the most famous stories about Mueller's faith was this. One morning, he awoke to the news that the orphanage had no food. At the time, it housed 300 children. Mueller had the house mother see all the children in the dining room. He thanked God for food, and within minutes, a baker knocked at the door. He told George that the night before, he couldn't sleep. Somehow, he knew that the orphanage would need bread that morning, so he got up and baked three batches for them, and he brought it in. Almost immediately following the baker's departure, another knock came at the door and a milkman whose cart had broken down in front of the orphanage said, the milk is gonna spoil. By the time I fix my cart, I need to get rid of it. And would the children like some fresh free milk? And God continued provisions like this in the life of George Mueller. These orphanages grew, heat and medicine and clothing and food and bread for over 100,000 orphans. This is what faith can do in the life of somebody that trusts God. Nothing is too difficult for thee. George Mueller is just a man, and I just want to close with this. He's not extraordinary. His God is extraordinary. His faith was extraordinary, was a gift. He trusted and had confidence and followed and served the same God that we have, who does not change who can still do what he has done. Big prayers of faith. Turn your eyes to the Lord. Keep your gaze fixed on him. Surround yourself with women who have the gift of faith and see what God can do and let it encourage you, embolden you, and press you forward in honoring the Lord and what he's given you to do. Let's pray. Holy God, I just thank you for these women that have come here tonight, for their um, love for you, for their excitement over what you can do and what you are doing in our churches, Lord. We just pray right now for our conversation around the table that it would be honoring to you, that we would encourage one another and lift each other up. I pray, Father, that as we're studying the spiritual gifts, that you would just give us a passion and a zeal to follow you, to love you, to serve you, to pivot and pour out the gifts that you give us to our sisters in Christ, to those who are in need. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and grab some more refreshments. Uh,